Hello, I'm Patricia Gober, uh, Professor of Geography at Arizona State University. And I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about uh, my research on water policy. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the um, Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz for supporting the work that we've done in the um, Water Prize 2009. Uh, I'd like to take, talk today about the fusion of water science and public policy. Uh, as a social scientist, my interests are in decision-making, social learning, and knowledge mobilization. Uh, the 15-year effort that I would like to talk about today was uh, funded and initiated by the National Science Foundation in the United States. And the premise for the um, program that we were funded was that we were looking at climate research and was, we were not translating climate research into action and public policy very effectively. And so the National Science Foundation put together an initiative to invite people to come up with new ways of sharing climate science with decision-making so that it will be more effective and lead to actual changes in policy. So the name of the program was Decision-Making Under Uncertainty. How do we make decisions about climate change in the face of inevitable uncertainty about the climate? Um, for us, it meant, um, uh, asking what if questions, um, what if particular scenarios of the future were to come to play, what kind of policy change would be important in those situations? We regarded ourselves as a boundary organization in the sense that we would uh, invite both practitioners, water managers, as well as water scientists to come together with us to talk about um, uh, climate change and how we might better prepare for it in metropolitan Phoenix. The pictures that you're looking at are, um, uh, include the uh, major water modelers in the Western United States on the, on the West, sitting with the water managers in um, metropolitan Phoenix. And on the right, you look at what we had available to us was a decision theater, uh, a place where we could visualize um, scenarios and different decisions and decision outcomes um, uh, for the city of Phoenix. And um, it was available to uh, uh, us to be able to uh, look at the results of our, of our activities. I ultimately published a, a book uh, dealing with uh, decision-making under uncertainty in Phoenix and um, the work that united uh, climate scientists and um, water managers calling it um, Building Resilience for Uncertain Water Futures, uh, published by Algrave McMillan. Let me tell you a little bit about Phoenix um, as a background for the research that we did. Phoenix has, an, has um, a, about uh, uh, four and a half million people, and it enjoys a fairly um, diverse water supply. So it gets water from the Salt and the Verde River um, near, near immediately upstream from Phoenix. It gets water from the Colorado River, and also it has groundwater. So in times of shortage, uh, we've of the surface supplies, we've been able to call upon our groundwater sources to support, to support the city. Uh, but this picture from the Lake Mead in Hoover Dam on the Colorado River is an everyday reminder of the uncertainty associated with uh, water supply as a result of climate change on the Colorado River. And so this is a, um, a, a, a wake up call for Phoenix to take greater um, uh, foresight, greater action in the future for how to manage its water resources 
in the face of inevitable uncertainties about the um, about the climate and the um, the water supply on the on the Colorado River, which we see so starkly in this picture. So, if if um, climate were it's one source of uncertainty about um, the water security of Phoenix. There are other sources of, of, of uncertainty. Uh, we projections of growth vary from um, some that will be some six million to uh, nine million. So there's an uncertainty associated with the level of population growth and the water that will be required to support the additional people. There's also this graph which shows the trends in uh, gallons per capita per day, water use uh, in, um, in the United States uh, uh, after 1950. And it rose quickly until, um, until, it, uh, until about uh, 1995, and it's been declining ever since. Most people attribute this to um, more efficient um, water fixtures and, uh, and appliances. Whether this trend will continue is a question. Um, so the trends will, I think most of the, the, the water managers think that we've pretty much um, wrung as much efficiency out of the system as is possible. And any further reductions will come from outdoor water use, which is another source of uncertainty because Phoenix has traditionally been more of a, uh, an oasis city. Uh, it's, a, it's a desert city, but it, it, uh, it uses its water supply for, um, uh, to uh, support rich um, vegetation as of the sort that you've seen here. Now, the extent to which people are willing to shift to something more like, like a desert city that we find in the city of Tucson, about 100 miles south of Phoenix, we, we really don't know the capacity of the population or the predilection of the population to be able to, to change its, um, its uh, water use for outdoor, for outdoor purposes. So that's another uncertainty. Um, the capacity of the population to, um, to conserve water to support more growth and um, uh, under a different lifestyle. So we assert here that we have a problem of, of deep uncertainty. And problems of deep uncertainty are, are characterized by fundamental disagreements about the problem at hand, about the probability distributions that define the key variables, and disagreement about what are the what are the best outcomes? What do, we, what do we want to get out of this problem? So decision scientists characterize this as a problem of deep uncertainty. And we regard the climate change issue in Phoenix as a problem of deep uncertainty. And under these conditions, we ask different sorts of questions than we would ask in a traditional science problem. Problems of deep uncertainty trigger us to ask, what kind of future do we want? And what decisions do we need to make to get there? What's the range of how the future might look? And how do we re avoid regrettable outcomes? We're not in the business of optimizing anymore. We're in the business of finding alternatives that will work across a range of futures because we don't know what those futures will be. What ifing? What are the consequences of particular decisions in a complex system? What policies work best across a range of climate futures? What are the costs of delaying decisions, say for another 10 infrastructure decisions for another 10 or 15 years? What are the trade-offs between the costs and the risks of making expenditures that are not necessary? different kinds of questions than we would ask if we were in a traditional optimization problem. So my research group built a water simulation model that you can see here with our three sources of water, the 
Um, the Verde River immediately north of um, Phoenix and the Salt River, the Colorado River and groundwater. And we use this model to ask questions about the future under different policy choices. The, um, the slide you're looking at here looks at uh, policy choices where we've imposed um, uh, wastewater reclamation at uh, 16%. We can increase that to 30% to 75%. And we can look at the outcomes for what this means for how much further growth can we support in metropolitan Phoenix. A second policy outcome is um, to transfer agricultural water on the urban fringe for urban purposes. A third is to um, ensure environmental flows. And a fourth is to alter per capita water use. So we have these policy levers that we can begin to um, mix and match to be able to um, um, envision different futures that will sustain a more a, a sustainable city that would uh, be able to function and continually um, uh, grow and prosper uh, for say a hundred years. We show our our um, our decision model with all of the policy levers and all of the outcomes in a decision theater um, where we can bring stakeholders and decision makers, stakeholders and um, scientists together to uh, create new scenarios that um, decision makers may be more interested in, uh, in the hopes of uh, implementing the kind of um, um, or integrating the kind of science that we we produce into um, in, into their decisions. I just threw in a few more slides to show that we uh, I spent ten years in Canada um, after uh, and um, we implemented very much the same model there as encouraging a great deal of stakeholder engagement, which you see in in this picture, in the hopes of um, asking the right research questions when we begin to um, probe the, the ultimate effects of, uh, of climate change. We also asked the Canadians, what, did they, what were relevant issues to them so that we might um, frame our, we can frame our problems in a variety of ways. What really were they interested in? And one of the, um, as, we, as we analyze their, their documents and as we analyze their discourse, we found that stakeholders were very interested in hazards. So we began to try to view our, um, many of our problems as, as hazards because that's what the decision makers, that's what the stakeholders were interested in. And what did we learn over 15 years in the United States and Canada of working intensely uh, to connect stakeholders and uh, scientists and climate scientists and stakeholders, what, what we learned about what worked to integrate the best climate scientists, science into water management decisions. We learned that one-off efforts don't build a common understanding of the problem at hand. A single research project seeking out stakeholders is unlikely to sustain the kind of research effort. It, it's, um, it's an ongoing trial and error and some things work and some things don't. Uh, and we learned after 15 years, had a better idea of what was working for us and what wasn't working for us. But the one-off efforts are, um, are re really not going to get us where we want building trust and getting information from people, what they really, how, how do they make their water decisions? Um, when do they make their water de decisions? Who makes their water decisions? And how can we intervene in that process and appropriately with the climate 
information that we have. Um, interactivity between scientists and users is absolutely critical to, to knowledge transfer. Uh, people, scientists have written uh, articles about um, um, the loading dock model of science, that um, scientists do their work and then throw it off to decision makers and expect them to use it. The interactivity between these two groups over a long period of time, getting to know each other is crucial in knowledge transfer. We believe that someone needs to own the process of not knowledge transfer. Uh, in a perfect world, there'll be an expert in the user community, who's a water manager who's particularly interested in working with scientists, or there might be an interested scientist who, who likes to work with, um, with decision makers. But um, ultimately, somebody has to be charged with connecting the best science with the decisions that face us on the ground. Uh, so we believe that a, a boundary organization is necessary to mediate the boundary between science and policy. That boundary organization um, facilitates social learning between the groups that stands us well when uh, controversies arise. So our group, the Decision Center for a Desert City, always framed itself as a boundary organization. We were sitting with the university's um, uh, scientists, but also reaching out to the um, to the community. That was that was our job, our first job, and we began to um, assess the way um, what worked and what didn't work. So a boundary organization is critical to facilitate this process. We used models to simulate alternative futures, um, asking what if scenarios. Um, uh, scientists sometimes um, make up scenarios that, that, um, that are very arbitrary. Um, we end up with very different scenarios when we ask water managers, um, what are possible futures that you can see and how can we integrate those into our, into our models. So to use our models in, in, um, in working with decision makers um, at the same time to, to envision these alternative futures. What if we do this? What if we reduce water use by 15%? How much is that going to, um, uh, leeway is that going to give us under certain climate conditions? And uh, we uh, use models to reveal critical trade-offs between lifestyle and growth and conservation and infrastructure. It's always a choice between um, uh, um, the decisions are, are, are trade-offs. And, and if we can begin to model those trade-offs and use the science to be able to better understand those, those trade-offs, we can actually um, facilitate the decision process on the ground. And finally, the most important lesson we learned that, that this was a 15-year effort. It took 15 years to build trust, to get to know people, to make mistakes and to recover from those mistakes to send students out for um, uh, 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 experience working in, um, in, for internships, working in, in agencies, and then coming back and, and informing the, the science uh, development effort was a way to begin to, um, to influence public policy. So with that, I will end my remarks um, and uh, say that the, um, it's, uh, it's easy to do policy research and it's easy to do, um, or science is, we can do science work and we can do policy work, but doing work to draw the two groups together and then to 
evaluate what works and doesn't work was really our, our goal. And I think uh, laid a groundwork for um, better climate change, climate adaptation planning in Phoenix. Thank you.